of us who have spoken to you tonight has represented a different field of endeavor in American life. I want to speak about the attack on culture, not because I work in the field of culture. I speak because I am an American, and as an American, I shall always resist any attempt at the abridgment of freedom. That, that is why I am here tonight. In a sense, we are telling the same story. Mr. Kenny, Dr. Pauling, Dr. Hudson, Earl Robinson, and myself. Telling it from a slightly different point of view, perhaps. But in the main, concerning ourselves with varied aspects of the same picture. This is important to remember, I think. The attacks upon the scientist, upon the member of a minority group, upon the artist, are one and the same attacks, camouflaged to confuse us, to create disunity and defeat. We, the writers, the actors, the scientists, the educators, have been chosen as a primary target for attack by the rankings the Tennies, and others of that ill. There is a good reason why we were given such a high priority on their list. The artist, since the beginning of time, has always expressed the aspirations and dreams of his people. Silence the artist, and you silence the most articulate voice the people have. <laughs> destroy culture, and you destroy one of the strongest sources of inspiration from which a people can draw strength to fight for a better life. <laughs> Needless to say, the attack is pushed on all fronts. While the writer and educator are being smeared, the mechanic is being relieved of his hard-won right to organize and bargain, and the white-collar worker is being forced to accept a lower standard of living through unchecked inflation and growing unemployment. <clears throat> Announcer. 
was warned by his station that because he had made recordings for labor groups, his voice would become identified and he would lose his value to his sponsor and, of course, his job. This, mind you, despite the fact that his name was not used on the recording. Next, the field of the theater. The script of a famous play was investigated by the Thomas Rankin Committee. The reason? The play dealt with problems of Negroes in the South. The name of the play? Deep are the Roots. Explore the real problems of the people and you are rewarded with an investigation? Item two, the theater continues. In two American cities, Peoria, Illinois, and Albany, New York, Paul Robeson, an American citizen, was refused the right to speak at a public meeting. A great artist, the most articulate voice of the Negro people, Mr. Robeson was an obvious threat for the men who ignore the meaning of the Bill of Rights. He spoke of peace and tried to use his art for social good. Consequently, he was deprived of freedom of speech. Nor has the field of literature been overlooked. Many of you have probably read Howard Fast's book, Citizen Tom Paine. Just a minute. Be careful what you're clapping for. <laughs> this book has been banned in the high schools of New York City and Detroit. It presents a dynamic, dynamic concept of democracy. And uh, to certain people, this apparently is highly undesirable. The banning of citizen Tom Paine is closely related to the field of education. And here, too, the same people are very busy. Let me remind you of State Senator Tenney's activities. In the past, he has attacked dozens of university professors and administrative officials from Provost Dykstra of the University of California at Los Angeles to students who sympathized with motion picture strikers. Senator Tenney has just introduced 11 bills in the state Senate, which, if passed, will set California education back 50 years. These men have learned well that the hand which rocks the cradle shakes the world. They are determined to have thought control from cradle to grave. And a synonym for thought control is mass ignorance. The examples, regrettably, are endless. But let me mention just one more. Two years ago, the State Department purchased 79 representative paintings by American artists. These paintings were sent around the world as an exhibit of American art and culture. But the exhibition was suddenly halted, and the paintings returned to the United States to be auctioned. An explanation? The State Department said, quote, this is being done in the best interest of the State Department in view of the controversial issues involved, close quote. And the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Hearst Press... <laughs> this 
described the paintings as, and I quote, degenerate portraits authored by radical artists. Close quote. Perhaps you may remember that in Hitler, Germany, all works of art displeasing to the authorities were labeled decadent and Bolshevist-inspired. I have made frequent references to the Un-American Activities Committee. Certainly, if this committee truly were concerned with Un-American activities, it could well afford to clean its own house. can be found than the vicious, unwarranted attack by the chairman of this committee on a man whose sole crime lay in speaking for peace. I refer, of course, to Henry Wallace. His presence here tonight, rather than in the Hollywood Bowl, is another shocking instance of the attempted suppression of free speech. Nor have I given anything like a complete picture. In democratic United States, in the year of 1947, supposedly responsible government officials call for the outlawing of minority political parties and blithely ignore the freedom-shattering implication of their hysterical request. The President of the United States calls for a loyalty check, which can only be compared to the thought police of Imperial Japan when that country followed the fascist path to destruction and war. But the American people are not so gullible. They have proved in the past that they do not take kindly to the tactics of demagogues and organized parties of reaction. In the period immediately following the First World War, the Attorney General of the United States, one A. Mitchell Palmer, attempted, attempted to make political capital of terror and repression. His Justice Department swooped down upon and arrested thousands of innocent persons whose only crime was an alien status or holding a divergent political view from those of Mr. Palmer. However, Mitchell Palmer's presidential hopes faded with the rising tide of protest from the appalled public. And the party which instituted the political raids was defeated in the next national election. <coughs> Today, J. Parnell Thomas of the Un-American Activities Committee is engaged in a personally conducted smearing campaign of the motion picture industry. He is aided and abetted in this effort by a group of Hollywood super patriots <laughs> who call themselves the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals. For myself, I want no part of their ideals, nor those of Mr. Thomas. <laughs> Suffice it to say that on June 28, 1944, shortly after the formation of the Motion Picture Alliance, approximately 1,000 member delegates of 17 motion picture guilds and unions met to repudiate this organization and everything for which it stands. The validity of this action can be judged by the recent activities of the Alliance. 
They have enthusiastically supported the Rankin Thomas Committee. And their executive secretary, Dr. John Lechner, took the liberty of releasing a list of films which were called subversive. Among the so-called subversive pictures are, get this, the best years of our lives. Pride of the Marines. The strange love of Martha Ivers. Boomerang and Margie. <laughs> the members of the Alliance, the Thomases, Rankins, and Tennies, are concerned about the best years of our lives. This is a touching concern. No doubt. But why do the Thomases? the Rankins and Tennies and their bosses express no concern over the fate of the American people who face growing unemployment and a terrible depression. Their loud cries can be heard from one end of the country to the other, bewailing the danger of a book on democracy or a play about Negroes but they are strangely silent on the subject of housing. Which of them has ever raised voice for full employment, an adequate health program, and security for the American people? Who among them has cried the evils of discrimination against minorities or protested the feudal anti-labor legislation just passed by the Congress? And where do these men stand in the fight for peace? To achieve peace and lasting prosperity, there must be unity among us and among all the nations of the world. The same unity that won the war. America became great. Not because of the Salem witch hunt, but in spite of them. We are still great because the American people have always accepted the challenge of new ideas from the day that freedom was born in 1776 to this very moment. The American people eagerly grasped at French fresh concepts when they created this nation. The men and women who rode covered wagons across the plains followed the road of vigor and youth to new freedom and a fuller life. The path of middle-aged thinking not only sets back the clock, it leads only to the grave. And today, we won't turn the clock back, and we won't stand still. We'll move forward progressively forward. That is what the American people have always done. We will fight, not only to prevent the abridgment of freedom, but to broaden the freedoms that already exist. We will fight, not only for what we have and hold dear, but for what we hope to have, and deserve to have, and can have. And that is why we are here tonight. <laughs>